Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second in our series of three webinars um, on the topic of how to read a cancer genome. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Terry McVeigh. I'm a consultant clinical geneticist in the Royal Marsden. Um, I'll start off just with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so for those of you who tuned into our amazing webinar last week, the recording is now available so you can rewatch it or, or watch it for the first time if you didn't get an opportunity to tune in. We're going to put the link in our chat box um, so you can you can review that later. Um, for those of you who have joined, you should all be muted and your camera should be off and we'd appreciate if you could keep those off for the duration. If you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box and we'll go through them at the end of, of the talk. Um, so please don't use the chat uh, function if you can avoid it at all. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Pr Professor Nick Zainal, or Zainal, sorry who um, is an NIHR research professor in the University of Cambridge. She's also an honorary consultant in clinical genetics in the East of England GMSA. She's a superstar in uh, the realm of cancer research, um, internationally renowned, particularly for her work on mutational signatures and their application to um, clinical practice. And today's topic is the tertiary analysis beyond driver mutations. I could go on all day about your accolades, Serena, but I don't want to eat into your talk, so I'll, I'll hand over to you and we'll see you after. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Terry, for that introduction. Um, and I'm going to share my slides, hopefully. There, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, great. Okie dokie. So thank you so much, Terry, for that very kind introduction. Slightly embarrassing. Um, and I uh, hope that um, you uh, attendees today are here to um, listen about um, tertiary analytics beyond somatic drivers. So um, just as a bit of a recap on the first webinar, we covered the basic principles of cancer genomics and then primary and secondary analyses in cancer genomics, which is how to QC data, how to um, look at um, the outputs from um, mutation calling. And then we touched on the first bit of tertiary analysis, which is to look at driver mutations, those um, mutations that are believed to be causative for, for cancer. Now, I fully recognize that I didn't cover um, point 1.4, which was on the digital nature of NGS and how to look at it in terms of cancer evolution. If I have time, I'll cover it today. Otherwise, I'll add it into um, webinar three. But today I thought we would carry on in that tertiary analysis area, which is to go into tertiary analysis beyond drivers, which is on muta mutational signatures. So all the thousands and thousands of passenger mutations that are in a cancer genome. Um, there are five sections. I'll break it down for you now and say the first bit's really straightforward. The 0.2.2 and 2.3 is probably a little bit more intense in terms of content. So you just have to pay attention at that point. <laughs> um, I will highlight the clinically relevant sections as I did before with my little green person. Um, and then in section 2.4 and 2.5, that's probably where the most clinically relevant information is. There will be a summary table to help you. And then, you know, if you're really interested in the details, that's what section 2.5 is. OK, so um, let's start on 2.1. Um, so mutational signature analyses have now become a really expected part of genomic studies because they can reveal environmental and endogenous sources of mutagenesis in each tumor. And that's because um, as a cell turns from being a normal cell to a cancer cell, it's quietly accumulating mutations all the time. In fact, as you sit here listening to me, you are accumulating mutations as well. So some mutagenic processes in your DNA, it's perfectly normal. Um, but there are other mutagenic processes that perhaps a little less normal. So if you expose the DNA in your cells to environmental agents like tobacco smoke or um, a lot of UV light, then you might cause quite particular mutation patterns in the DNA of those cells. Now you might have um, uh, an immunogenic disorder. You might have uh, be working in an area where you have occupational exposures in bursts, so you might not have a continuous flow of DNA damage, but it might be occurring in sort of um, little um, spurts. Um, but we all have DNA repair pathways that usually mitigate this damage. So I think the point to take home here is that DNA damage is happening all the time. It's perfectly normal to have DNA damage, but we have an extensive set of DNA repair pathways that are supposed to be repairing all that damage, but 
sometimes we can acquire a DNA repair abnormality, or as a lot of clinical geneticists will know, some people are born or in, have inherited mutations in, in genes that are involved in DNA repair pathways. And so you might have a propensity to accumulate mutations as a result of the failure of DNA repair. So each one of these mutational processes will in theory leave a characteristic imprint that we call a signature, a mutational signature on the genome. But when you sequence a cancer genome, what you get is a final portrait. It's a composite of all the different mutational signatures and it's a function of the amount of all of those signatures um, that have occurred through tumor genesis. Um, and so, you know, unsurprisingly, in the past, when people have sequenced genomes, they've always just thought of these, what looks like a random collection of mutations as just bystander passenger events, they're just mutational debris. But in fact, if you have many of these sequenced cancer genomes together, particularly if they're of the same tumor type, you can try to figure out what are the signatures that are in common in many different tumors, and also even figure the amount of the exposures um, of these different mutational um, signatures. So I'm now going to introduce to you some of the mathematical concepts, but actually it's really simple. So just bear with me here. The terms that we tend to use is um, that the, the mutational profile that you get out the other side is called the catalog. Um, the patterns itself are called the signatures, which is S. And then the amount of each of the signature is what we call an exposure. Now you will hear in the mathematical community, they may refer to this as an activity or a contribution. But it's basically the same thing. It's basically the amount of each signature. So C is catalog, S is signature, and E is exposure. Now I can present that in a slightly different way. So if I take all the mutations and I count them up, count them up and I classify them like this, this is just the simple basic way of classifying substitution mutations. I get this pattern. This is the total mutational profile from one sample. And I want to break that down into different signatures. So these are the different signatures that have occurred and contributed and, and caused this sample. Now these signatures are also a function of how much of each of them this patient has. So signature one here is a thousand mutations, there's 1000 of this signature, there's one and a half thousand of this signature, and there's 750 of this signature. This is what catalog signatures and exposures mean. Um, and you saw that previous image of the visualization of what that looks like. It's actually such a simple function. <laughs> I think a lot of people really worry about mutational signatures being complex. It's really, really quite simple. So that's all it is. You'll remember this forever now. This is for a single sample. The same principle can apply if you have more than one sample. So let's say we have 20 samples, which I'm gonna show you in the next slide. It's the same thing, it's, it's 20 different samples. We've just counted up all of the mutations. But when you have many, many samples together, we tend to call it an a capital M instead of a capital C. Um, but it's still catalogs, it's still counts of every single sample. And again, we're trying to identify the signatures. These are the signatures that have contributed to these samples. The process by which we identify the signatures is called an extraction. That is when we're estimating the number of signatures and what they look like in these samples. And then the, the next thing we can do is quantify the amount of these signatures. This is called an assignment. So an assignment is when we estimate how much of each of these signatures is present in each sample. So here we have 20 samples and here we have the 20 sets of exposures of each of those samples telling us about the amount of each of these five signatures. So in fact, if you take nothing else home today, this is all, this is what I want you to be able to to understand that the mutational catalog, the final counts of mutations is just a function of what signatures are in them and how much of each signature is present in each sample. M is equal to S multiplied by E. Okay, so that is just the principle. And um, while I will go through um, the steps of extractions and assignments, the main thing I want you to take away today as well as a clinician is the most important thing for you is the assignment. OK, don't worry about the extraction. The extraction is a lot of mathematics and a lot of the people in the community, the academic community will do that for you. But you, when you're facing your patient and you get a cancer genome, what you need to know is, is the assignment any good? And we will, but I will go through both of those steps. OK, um, so let me just tell you a little bit about what a signature looks like, because I showed you 
this version of mutation counts, which is the six main channels, and there are six channels um, because these are the six types of base substitutions. But in fact, you could go a step further and classify them a little bit in taking a little bit more information into account. You can take into account um, the neighbors, so five prime base and three prime base, of which there's four possibilities, ACGT and ACGT. Um, and so four by four is 16. 16 multiplied by six gives you 96 channels. The signature is the entire 96 channel pattern, um, and it has certain dominant characteristics, which we'll go to shortly, but, but the point is that the signature is actually the whole thing. Um, now, my slides are having a little bit of a life of their own. Um, now, I've told you about substitutions, but there are other classes of signatures as well, because there's other mutation types. So we have double substitutions, which have 78 channels. There are rearrangement signatures, which have 32 channels. Um, a channel simply means the sort of numbers of ways that you can characterize things. And unhelpfully, in the academic community, you might find that people will change the number of channels. And sometimes if they don't have enough data to spread across the 96 or the 78 or the 32 channels, they might use something a little bit simpler. It's the same information. It's just that it has been um, being sort of put together in a slightly just added together, collapsed down um, into uh, fewer channels in order to increase power. So those are the channels of signatures. I'm just going to show you some examples of what signatures look like. So this is a very well known signature called signature one. It was the first one that was found and this is caused by deamination of methyl cytosine. It's when C to, you get C to T's at methyl CPGs. And this is another form of deamination caused by Apobex. Um, which because of differing repair pathways can result in two different outcomes. But all of these are perfectly natural and happening in all your normal cells all the time. These are signatures that are due to environmental agents. This is UV light, this is due to tobacco smoke, and this is due to erysolochic acid. And actually, well before whole genome sequencing was uh, came to light, these patterns were actually shown by others in the 1980s and 1990s in sort of um, gene reporter assays. So although the signatures help us to see things in a 96 channel context, in fact, a lot of it was shown from way back, uh, you know, before next generation sequencing technology was available. We've just been able to, to increase the granularity on these signatures. OK, so um, that was section one all covered already. Um, so you should, by the end of that, know what a mutational signature is and be able to explain it mathematically, which is C is equal to S times E. If you have many samples and it's just M is equal to S times E. Um, and then what's the difference between an extraction and an assignment and extraction? You're actually trying to identify the signatures. And in the assignment, you're trying to figure out how much of each signature is present in each sample. And then I explained the different channels in a mutational signature. So this is all just some prior knowledge. We're not going to go into a bit more of the detail on extracting mutational signatures. So this is rather academic. So if you want to put your pen down, that's fine. <laughs> but I think helpful for you to just understand this process, OK? Because people do sort of um, have questions about how robust this process is. So I think this is really uh, for your knowledge. So you saw this already. Um, given a collection of mutational catalogs here, M, um, we use different algorithms and there are about six or seven different algorithms now to be able to decompose these matrices. This is a matrix um, to infer the set of mutational signatures which are recurrent across multiple samples and then to estimate the relative contribution of the exposures um, for each sample. So that's what we're trying to do now. I'm going to show you a slightly complex version of this. This is a version you might see in some of the mathematical papers. It's the same information, just shown in a slightly different way. These are the mutations in your 96 channels, and here are your patients, three different patients here, for example. Here are the signatures we want to find, and we're going to show how much of each signature is present in each sample. Now, this is a process that can produce multiple solutions. So when I take this and I put it through an algorithm, I could get one solution, but I could get another solution. And in fact, I could get any number of solutions depending on how many times I want to run this exercise. To know whether your signatures are any good and whether it's not just mathematical hocus pocus, there are a number of things that you can do to check that it is actually robust. And one of the things we do is to perform clustering of these signatures from all the solutions. 
Because in fact, if signature A is a reproducible, robust and consistent signatures, signature, then no matter how many times you do it, it should still be there. So if you run it a hundred times and you find that across a hundred times, you're still getting the same signature, you know this is a this is a good signature. Whereas if you run it several times and you find B here is called once, but is not seen ever again, then perhaps this is a less robust signature. So this is a process which is an iterative process. That's the first thing we do. We check whether it is reproducible across multiple runs. The second thing we do is to do something called a reconstruction. Based on the signatures and the exposures for each patient, we will reconstruct that catalog because this is just mathematics, right? You can go backwards and forwards. So given this potential solution, I'm going to try to reproduce that. This is what we call a reconstructed catalog. Then we compare it to the original catalog. And actually, if we just ignore the math and just look at them using the organic interface, you'll find that they actually look rather similar, which is good. Now, there will be differences. As you can see, the total number that's been reconstructed here is fewer than the original catalog. And so there is an error. There is a set of unassigned mutations or residuals. And what you'd really like to do is to minimize the number of unassigned mutations, minimize that error, minimize that residual so that your reconstructed catalog mimics your original catalog as far as possible. And you do this iteratively and basically the inf what the, we use the information from the clustering. So in red, it's how reproducible the signatures are. And in blue, it's a measure of how low the reconstruction can be. And the solution that we choose for an extraction is based on when that reproducibility drops and when the error starts to increase. This is the general principle that we use to try to estimate the number of signatures in a sample. And while this looks really clear, <laughs> the reality is it's not always this clear, okay? So, but I wouldn't worry about it in general. Um, uh, the total number of signatures that are found um, you know, let's say the answer should be 10, but you've chosen 11 or you've chosen 9. In general, the big important signatures that matter to the patient, you will find because they tend to be quite clear. If something is a little bit weak, then you, you're probably, you probably haven't got that signature in the sample, okay? So in general, even if you are one off, it's probably fine. Okay, so that is the extraction process. I'm just now going to, to sort of um, highlight some of the reasons, some of the caveats that the extraction, why, about why the extraction process isn't that perfect. So the first thing to say is the mutational signatures don't all behave in the same way. Some are subject to more uncertainty than others because this is biology. Things are never equally, things never behave in, the, in an equal way. So here's a signature that is, whoops, here's a signature that is, um, uh, has particularly prominent features. It's got tall peaks at specific trinucleotide context. It's very clear, it's very dominant. And so if I run that signature extraction a thousand times and I plot it, I find that that signature forms this lovely discrete cluster because it's very easy to extract. It's a very clear signature. By contrast, if you look at these signatures, they sort of form this almost ring that can sometimes be miscalled for each other. And that's because if you look at the signatures, they're very flat. They've got rather featureless profile as compared to that, and they get mistaken for each other rather a lot. Now that's important because this signature that I've highlighted with the red box is the one that was associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 deficiency right at the start in the first paper on mutational signatures. But because it's so flat, a lot of noise also gets called signature three. And so this tends to be a bit of a dumping zone. Um, a lot of things which is not signature three and not bracket deficiency ends up getting called signature three. So it's an error and it's something for us to all be aware of. I'll come back to this again shortly. The next caveat to mention is that the number of signatures you extract is related to the size of the cohort that you're studying. So when I first studied 21 signatures, I got five signatures. Uh, so when 21 cancers, I got five signatures. When I studied uh, 560 breast cancers, I got 12 signatures. It's just an increase in power. Now, when I study 5,000 breast cancer genomes, what I'm gonna find, I'm gonna find a few more, that's for sure. But at some point, it does start to saturate as well. But the point is the number of signatures you extract is related to the size of the cohort you're studying. Um, and this is just to give you an overview of the field. So I first published on mutational signatures in 2012. This was just on 21 breast cancers. There were five signatures. 
Since then, we got 21 signatures and then 30. And then we had rearrangement signatures and then we had more substitution, double sub indel signatures. You know, it is increasing all the time. So it's a little bit, um, it may feel a little bit mind boggling, but I think the point really for you to take home is that the academic community will at some point come up with the reference set and give you the guidance as to how to use the signatures because it's not a good idea to use all 94 substitution signatures. I'll come to that shortly. Um, and um, and don't worry about having to do extractions because you shouldn't need to. You should just be doing an assignment as a clinician. I'm just explaining what the extraction process is so that you have an idea of what's going through the heads of the academics when they're doing it. So that's the extraction bit. You just need to understand the theoretical principle, which is entirely academic, of how you take signatures or you, how you, you um, extract signatures from a large data set and to be aware of the caveats that there's multiple potential solutions. Some signatures are subject to more uncertainty than others. And the number of signatures that's extracted from a data set is the function of the size of the data set. So just be wary when someone quotes a paper at you and says, oh, well, they only found four signatures in that paper. Well, they only had 25 samples and that's probably the reason why. OK, so that was the academic bit on the extraction. This next section is far more important to you as a clinician. When you get the mutational profile from a patient here, this is a patient with an ovarian cancer. We'll call her patient A. This is her catalog. You want to know what signatures are present in that sample. So to estimate the exposure, um, people use a number of different tools. There's about, again, about somewhere between eight and 10 different um, tools to do this. Don't worry about it. What's important is what are the signatures that you use to, to estimate that exposure? Because remember I said the academic community will have done this bit. They will tell you these are the signatures. So let's say we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight signatures in ovarian cancer. This is our patient. You just want to know what E is, okay? That's what you're trying to do. Now, this is probably the most conservative and the most robust way to figure out a signature in this patient. But today, because there are so many signatures in the literature, people are doing all sorts of things. They're using 30 signatures, they're using 94. Actually, we've got a paper coming which has 160, but I do not recommend using 160 signatures to look for the exposures of your sample. I'll explain why shortly. And it is still most conservative and most effective to just restrict your signature search to the signatures that are relevant to your tumor type. And that totally makes sense. Really. If you think about um, GWAS, your GWAS SNPs are different between different four different tumor types and, and risk. So the signatures are, you know, if as a clinician, you are much better off just focused on the signatures that are specific to your organ. OK, so let me show you why. So here's our same patient A. If we fitted, we tried to assign um, signatures um, to, for, to this patient's, uh, for this patient's sample, we could look for the eight tissue relevant signatures for this cancer, or we could use the 30 cosmic signatures. And the problem is that when you do the 30 cosmic signatures, what happens is every single signature will be looked for, regardless of whether it's biologically present or not. This process is, a sim is simply a mathematical one. All it's doing is trying to fit as many of the signatures as you present to it as possible. So if you say this is patient A, fit 30 signatures, that's what it will do. If you say fit 50, that's exactly what it will do. So if you say fit eight, because this is most relevant to my tissue, then that is what it will do. So when you fit 30, you get all sorts of, you know, you get a wide distribution, it's more uncertainty you get false positive assignments. And this is the joy of my life when I get to review papers that tell me that there is tobacco smoke signature in the prostate, which I think is highly unlikely. Either your patient has got an extraordinary talent or you've done it wrong. That's the second thing is probably most likely. Um, so when you do it with fewer signatures, you find that it's um, a tighter analysis. There's less uncertainty and you have fewer false positive assignments. So I think the message there is 
narrow the search space. Don't go for 30 signatures or 100, and please don't go for 160. You'll have, get a mess of a result. Go for the tissue specific signatures. Now, some of you may say, well, you might miss some rare signatures. Aha, uh -huh. well, we'll come to that shortly. You won't. OK, so the things that you have to ask yourself when you're doing this as a clinician is, have we assigned the right signatures to the sample? Is it the right tissue of origin? Now, I think some of you will say, well, OK, it's fine if I'm a breast surgeon or I'm a ovarian cancer specialist or prostate person, but what about cancers of unknown primary? Well, there will be guidance on that um, from from uh, from sort of new information that's coming soon. Um, is there anything that's out of the ordinary is the other question that you have to ask. So if we look at the relative quantities of signatures that are present in that tumor type and you look at where your sample sits, so the red dot is your sample. And you know, these are the five common signatures, let's say in breast cancer. And this is my sample with a red dot. It's sitting right in the middle of everything. Yes, this fits. My sample does not behave in a weird way. It's the old adage. Does it fit? And if it does, then OK, that's good. There's nothing that's too untoward here. The next question you need to ask is, are there any clinically relevant signatures? Because remember what I said at the start, some signatures are just normal. They're just completely part of the everyday sort of being uh, breathing in oxygen and, and having water in your body. Um, so some signatures are completely irrelevant. But what you want to know are, are, are there any signatures that might be useful for a clinical trial or for a particular therapy or that might be a prognostic indicator? OK, so um, I will go through some of those signatures, some of these clinically relevant signatures in detail. But for now, I just want you to take I just want to take you through a couple of examples. So here is a breast cancer. Here's a mutational catalog from a breast cancer, 17,000 SNVs. Um, and here's the signature outcome. So these are the different signature types, uh, signature 13, 5, 8, 2, 3, 18, 127, 17. And here, it's it, this is a threshold. We do have a cutoff. Anything below it, we're going to ignore. Anything above it, we will say, it is present in the sample. So in this sample, there's signature 13, 5, 8, 3, and 127. Um, and if we look at, uh, so the question, first question that we asked was, have we assigned the right signatures for this tumor type? And the answer is yes. We've used the breast common signatures that have been identified in the Genomics England data. Great. OK. Is it? within um, normal limits. Is this anything out of the ordinary? No, these are all the common signatures and the, the sort of total values seem to be reasonable. Are there any clinically relevant signatures? And the answer is yes. Signature three is a clinically relevant signature. I mentioned it before. This is the one that's been associated with HR deficiency. But I also mentioned that it's a bit of a dumping ground for, for error and noise. Um, and so you need to look out for other features to ensure that this isn't just overfitting. I will come to some of those uh, and some algorithms that are used to help uh, you make that decision. So that's one example. Let's do another one. Um, so look at that profile. Just look at that profile. I mean, you know, it's quite clear that it's quite different to the previous one. That profile is quite different, isn't it? This profile, after some time, after you've seen this about six times, you'll, you'll recognize it from the other end of the room. This is mismatch repair deficiency. Um, and if we look across here, we're not seeing very much. We're seeing a little bit of signature one. And as I mentioned earlier, some of you will say, well, Serena, if you only look for the signatures that are known in breast cancer, you're going to miss anything that's unusual. And mismatch repair deficiency is not usual in breast cancer. But in fact, the latest iteration of how we do this, which is coming soon, um, or that has been trained on Genomics England data, um, it will allow you to look for the presence of unusual and rare signatures. OK, and so you'll be able to keep your eye there on the right hand side. You'll be able to identify that there's a new rare signature here called signature 44, which is mismatch repair deficiency. SPS 44 is associated with mismatch repair. It's got a very distinctive profile and tends to be a hypermutative phenotype. So these are the right signatures. Is it behaving out of the ordinary? It is a bit out of the ordinary for breast cancer, but does it fit with mismatch repair? Yes, it does. Is this clinically relevant? Yes, it is. OK, this is example number three. This is again is a breast tumor. If you look at this profile, and this is kind of a actually a lot what a lot of what you're seeing here is C2T and CPG, which is signature one. And a lot of people just go, OK, well, this looks like a pretty boring, boring sample. Um, have we fit the right signatures? Yes, these are breast common signatures. Is there anything out of the ordinary? Well, actually, there is. 
the algorithm tells you that there's an additional signature called signature 33, which has not been reported before in breast cancer. The cause of signature 33 is unknown. That's what it looks like, that's signature 33. And in fact, if you use your organic interface, you can see signature 33 there because you can see signature one, but you can see signature 33 as well. So as long as you walk through those three steps, every time you look, kind of look thinking about signatures, you will not really go wrong. Um, and if you notice, I keep saying to you to use your organic interface because you know we're all trained as medics to spot patterns. And, and a lot of the times I can make a call on signatures without even using the algorithm. <laughs> I can use uh, just the experience of having seen a lot of these a lot of the time. OK, so now, I've sort of covered the assignment bit um, and I hope I've driven home the message of what's important there for you as a clinician. Now, let's say you find things which may be clinically re relevant. How do you reinforce what you suspect um, with other information? So this is going to be a table to make life easy for us all. Um, it's going to address what the biological abnormality is. It's going to help you answer the question, what are the other genomic features that are associated with this biological abnormality? Are there any algorithms or scores to support my finding further? Because if you think it's HR deficiency and you've got an algorithm that says it's 99% likely to be HR deficient, then that's great, it's good for you. Um, and then I think this is very important. Can I find a cause? Can I find a genetic or epigenetic cause to explain my HR deficiency or my mismatch repair deficiency or whatever? Um, so look for positive reinforcement, but just as important, look for things to be wary of. Look for the negative things as well. It's like doing any scientific experiment, positive stuff, negative stuff, positive controls, negative controls, other things to look out for. So if all this information I'm throwing at you is just a bit much, rest easy. There is a table that summarizes all of it there for you, and this may change in time. I will uh, add that caveat that there is a table in case it's all getting a bit much and you want to put down your pens and lean back, your arms behind your head. You can just listen to the rest of the of the presentation. The point is a lot of the information has been summarized in this table. Um, and bottom line, if ever anything looks bizarre, always ask, has the assignment been done appropriately? And a lot of times it hasn't. OK, so that, that I think tends to be the killer um, uh, when I get to review papers from people. OK, so that's the summary table of clinically relevant signatures today. Um, but I'm going to go through the details for the next sort of 20 minutes or so. Um, and uh, but as I said, if it's all getting a bit much, you can just put down your pens and just listen to me drone on for the next 25 minutes. OK, so um, let's do HR deficiency first. Um, so in HR deficiency, the historical bit of information um, that we presented in 2012 was this signature three, which I've already pointed out is really flat and it's a bit of a pain uh, when we're doing signature assignments. Um, but the good thing is that if you see signature three, you need to look for a few other things. Is signature eight there? Is there an indel pattern called microhomologous microhomology mediated deletions? Are there rearrangement signatures and is there a copy number pattern? So I'm going to take you through this now. So signature three and eight are kind of a bit boring and a bit flat, uh, but the indel pattern is a really marked one. So what happens is here is the here are examples of two deletions occur occurring at chromosome eight and chromosome seventeen. That's a sequence. A microhomologous deletion has a few bases that are homologous to the next bit, which uh, where the at the indel junction. So the bit that's deleted, the motif that's deleted, has some homologous sequence with the bit that it joins up to. So in this case, there's a TG, TG that is homologous to the TG downstream, and here there's an AAA that's homologous to the AAA downstream. The indels tend to be larger. They tend to be three base pairs or more. Um, and this was you know, one of the first things I picked up during my PhD. Thank God, because I, so far I had had negative results for about a year and a half. Um, so this is a really marked phenotype. It's a real, you know, sign of BRCA deficiency. So that's what we mean by microhomology mediated deletions. Then rearrangement signatures in BRCA deficient tumors. Um, there's something called rearrangement signature three RS3. This is characterized by tandem duplications, which are bits of the DNA that are duplicated and then inserted immediately in tandem. 
but in the BRCA deficient tumors, they tend to be 10 kb or less or smaller. OK, so they tend to be quite small. Uh, but if you look through the genome, you'll find that it's just happening throughout the genome. So it feels like a kind of a replicative abnormality uh, where a bit of DNA is copied and then du it's duplicated and then, and then inserted back again. It just keeps going throughout the genome. So that's rearrangement signature three. It tends to be a feature of BRCA1 deficient cancers. Rearrangement signature five is um, characterized by deletions. So in red, red and del is deletions. Um, sorry, I, I should have said non-clustered means that it's not focused in one part of the genome. It's distributed throughout the genome. So RS5 rearrangement signature five is again another classical feature of BRCA deficient cancers. There are sections that tend to be 10 kb or less again um, that are deleted again throughout the genome. Really classical patterns and in the next webinar, when I show you how to look at the whole genomes with all the information together, you will see some of these patterns um, up front. And then last but not least are the copy number abnormalities in HR deficient cancers. So this was the classical pattern that was first described in HR deficient tumors by the likes of Myriad. The Myriad score is basically copy number patterns. And what you're seeing here, you saw copy number plots in my last webinar, hopefully. Purple means total copy number and blue means minor allele. And what you're seeing here is the minor allele in blue is all down at zero throughout the genome in lots of places. So that's a lot. There's many, many chromosomes where there's whole arms or whole chromosomes that are completely lost. This is really classical of BRCA deficient cancers. And so this is a kind of a sort of a loss of heterozygosity throughout the genome. So if you have these patterns together, it really is a sign of BRCA1 or BRCA2 deficiency. Now, there are actually some subtle differences. The BRCA1 cancers have all of those signatures that I mentioned, whereas the BRCA2 deficient tumors, as well as PELB2 and RAD51C promoter hypermethylated cancers, they have all those features except the rearrangements. So they'll have all of these except this rearrangement signature three. They'll have all the rest. So there's a subtle difference there between the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 deficient cancers. But in a lot of my work, I, I tend, I've, I've reported this, but I tend not to differentiate between them because currently there's no clinical indication to separate these two things. But in fact, it is possible to separate them. So I've sort of given you the features, the other signature features that help you figure out whether something really does have HR deficiency or not. It's a bit hard though, isn't it? Let's try to make it easier. So we have created an algorithm that basically takes all the signature information and then goes 99% probability HR deficiency. That's what HR detect does. That's one of the algorithms that we've produced. Cord has been produced by the chaps in um, Holland. It's very similar to HR detect. It's just difference one thing between them. Myriad is the copy number algorithm um, that I mentioned earlier. All of these are just additional pieces of algorithmic computational tools to help you make that interpretation. So if you're looking at a sample and you're thinking this might be HR deficient, can I run one of those algorithms please to make sure to check to give me that confidence? Now a good decision support tool will just give it to you anyway. So hopefully um, by the time this starts to get into the NHS, all that information will just come to you. You'll get, you know, you'll get the signatures, you'll get signature three, you'll be able to find rearrangement signatures three and five and copy number scores and then you get the HR detect score or the court score or the myriad score. Maybe not myriad because I think that might be under license. Patented. OK, anyway, HR deficiency. Let's go to mismatch repair deficiency. Um, OK, so mismatch repair deficiency. There's about six signatures. In fact, there's a seventh that's not published yet. But as I said, that one is coming when the gel data gets published. Um, so there's six signatures there. Um, and they are sort of variations of each other if you look really closely. Um, and the other thing to say is that they are all associated with a high tumor mutational burden. So here's a mutational burden on the y-axis of this plot, and here are the different signatures named down here. And they're all somewhere in the region of 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6. That's, you know, a lot of mutations. Most somatic mutations are in the thousands, like 3,000, 8,000, maybe not tens, hundreds, or even a million sometimes, um, which is something that you can get with the mismatch repair deficient cancers. And so high tumor mutational burden or TMB is a feature that has been used clinically in order to classify tumors as being mismatch repair deficient. But this is a bit crude. It's just a total mutation burden. It's just a count. 
uh, whereas um, these are the different signatures um, that you can see are the outcome of mismatch repair deficiency. So you see one of these signatures, what else do you look for? You check that it's got a high tumor mutational burden. You check that there's an indel phenotype because mismatch repair deficiency is involved in post-replicative mismatch repair and you do get lots of deletions. So what you find is these tumors tend to have a high number of T deletions, particularly at polynucleotide repeat tract. So at T, 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 that sort of thing, you'll find there's a lot of deletions there. All of these signatures 6, 14, 15, 20, and 44 have an excess of T deletions at longer tracks. The longer the tracks, the higher the likelihood of having a deletion. SBS 26, by contrast, is the one that looks a little bit different to the rest and doesn't just have deletions, it has a lot of insertions as well. At the next webinar, I will show you some beautiful examples of this. The reason for this is gene specificity. SBS26 is often seen in PMS2, mismatch repair deficient tumors, whereas the others are seen in MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and sometimes in combination with polymerase uh, mutants, which I'll come to shortly. So these excess of deletions is what we call microsatellite instability or MSI. And again, MSI is sometimes used as a marker of mismatch repair deficient cancers when if you don't do signatures, you'll find a lot of people do, use something called MSI seq or they, they look for TMB. But basically, you know, this is it, it's a feature of the signatures um, associated with mismatch repair deficiency. So we can hunt down the genetic and epigenetic factors. Um, uh, you know, in, in the case of the HR deficient ones, we looked for BRCA1, BRCA2, PELB2, RAD51C. Here you want to look for MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS2. Um, and, you know, some of them are due to epigenetic mechanisms, which you may not have access to data to. So you might see the signature, you might not find the cause, but the signature is so marked, there's almost no question that there is mismatch repair deficiency. And we now know this because we've done immunohistochemistry on these samples, and sometimes the immuno is abnormal, even when we cannot find the cause. I would also say it's seen in many tumor types, not just in colon and uterine. Colon and uterine is where it's seen the most but it's certainly not just there. And just like what I mentioned earlier, but using other algorithms to reinforce your finding, you can use any of these additional algorithms that are out there. MSI seq, TMB, MMR detect, all of it helps you to have the conviction that you're, that what you're seeing is mismatch repair deficiency. Okay, then um, this one is polymerase epsilon or Paul E dysregulation. So this was known as SBS10 until 2020. And then it, this was split by the academic community into SBS 10A to 10D, but this has not been validated. There's new data, and in fact, it's experimental data now to, to support SBS 10A as being the Paul E dysregulated signature. And why is it important to pick up? It's because it has been shown to have sensitivity to immunotherapies. So this is what SBS 10A looks like. It's got a tall blue peak C to A right at the end that's at TCT. It's got a tall pink peak T to G mutations at TTT. -T. <laughs> um, and those are the two main features. Now you can go to sites and sort of explore these in more detail. I will say that if you have a Paul E signature, you will find every sample that has got the Paul E signature you should find the driver mutation. So we published and you can go to this site um, to look at this information in more detail, the different circles will tell you like the prevalence of the samples on which tumor types, etc. I don't have enough time to go into it today, but I'll just put it here in case you are interested. But I would say that if you are seeing this signature, hunt down that Paul E mutation because in our latest piece of work, it's not published yet, but it's coming soon in Genomics England, every single polymerase epsilon signature, uh, every single cancer that had polymerase epsilon signature had the Paul E mutation. So you should be able to find it. Um, so, so work quite hard at that. And why? Because these tumors tend to be sensitive to immunotherapies. And certainly we managed to get a patient um, checkpoint inhibitor um, treatment um, as a result of being able to demonstrate his polymerase epsilon mutation in the end, which was in a subclone. So it's an important one to find. Um, it is seen in about 6% of uterine cancers, 1% of colorectal cancers, and less than 1% of other tumor types. So it's a rare thing, but but if you do see it, it's really, it's really one to not miss and 100% of cases have an identifiable genetic cause, so don't miss this one. That's the message. <laughs> okay, 
This is not an unusual scenario where you get a mixture of mismatch repair deficiency with polymerase dysregulation. So signature 14 and signature 20 have been reported by others, not by us, by the Broad, in fact, um, as being due to a mixture of mismatch repair deficiency and polymerase mutants. The one at the top is, I think, um, and mismatch repair and pull E. The one at the bottom is mismatch, mismatch repair and pull D. They will have a high tumor mutational burden. They will have a high indel phenotype. Um, and um, uh, but we haven't always been able to find the cause. We haven't always been able to find a genetic cause or, a, or an epigenetic cause. Um, so um, I think the message I was trying to communicate here is that you do sometimes get mixtures of signatures like these two. Now, these tumors also have a huge number of mutations, sometimes in the millions. And when you're hunting down that cause, that genetic cause, if you've got so many mutations, then the chances of just hitting a potentially relevant gene is high. So just because you find a mutation in what you think might be a causative gene does not mean that it's definitely a driver. Remember that if it's a tumor suppressor gene, you really need to lose the other allele, right? So if it's not by allelic loss, it probably isn't. Um, and, and so just be a little bit mindful. If it's a missense mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, you're not, you cannot be sure it is a, a driver mutation at all. So just, just, just a caveat, some of these signatures, especially this one, which is a mix of mismatch repair and polymerase, tends to produce a really big mutative phenotype and not every mutation in, every, in, in some of the cancer genes are driver mutations. Okay. Uh, moving swiftly on, SBS 96, which is not yet published but coming soon, um, is due to MBD4. So, um, and the reason I highlight this is because we're germline geneticists um, and you might see this. So, uh, this tall peaks at CPGs is just like signature one. Here's a picture of signature one. Here's signature 96, and there's really very little difference between them. Signature one's got a little bit more noise at the bottom here. Um, signature 96 is a bit more clean. It's got these additional tiny peaks in the middle. But the other thing to note is that there tends to be a hyper mutative phenotype. So there tend to be, th these bars are much higher. This y-axis is very different to this y-axis, which you can't see, unfortunately. Um, but the other thing to note is that the relative heights are different. So this height is going from the tallest peak down, 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 whereas this is going down, this is going down, up, down, okay? And I know some of you will be sitting there going, really, Serena? <laughs> and, it really, it's true, it is important because I can show you what the extractions look like in different cohorts. So this is the gel cohort. This is the extraction from bone and soft tissue. This is the extraction from breast. This is the extraction from skin. These are all independently done. And this is the extraction from the Hartwick data set, uh, the metastatic cancer data set in skin. You can see how identical they are. They are so similar to each other and they are actually different to signature one. And again, this, these tumors have been reported to be sensitive to checkpoint inhibitors. So it's quite an important one to be able to spot. It tends to be a hypermutative phenotype. That's SBS96, that's SBS1. So SBS1 tends to be down here, 10 to the 3. SBS96 is up there, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. Um, and as I said, associated with MBD4 mutations, not always found. We didn't always find them in Genomics England, for example. They are rare, but they are happening in several tumor types, a little bit sporadically. Um, but they are associated with response to immunotherapy. So again, one to be able to identify. This is SBS30, um, C2Ts, and they have this very particular pattern in pairs. Um, uh, the tallest peaks are C2Ts at um, NPCPA or NPCPC, which is NPCPA is this first one here, that one there, that one there. NPCPC is that one there, that one there, and that one there. Um, they tend to have a slightly higher mutative uh, mutation count, mutation burden, uh, tends toward a hypermutative phenotype, but not perhaps as high as the mismatch repair signatures. They tend to be associated with NTHL1 mutations in the germline and or somatic. And again, they're not always found. Now, this has been validated in an experimental setting. In fact, that's where it was found by Hans Cleaver's lab in 2017. Again, it's rare, but it does occur in several tumor types. Um, and then th these ones have been reported to be potentially sensitive actually to PARP inhibitors, um, weirdly, um, but because this is in this is a base excision repair pathway and perhaps leans on um, the single strand break repair pathway, which is where PARP acts. So it may not be a surprise that you'll find in your lifetime that PARP inhibition will be used for other situations and not just HR deficiency. 
Okay, and now we're going to SPS 36. I'm sort of conscious we're in the last few minutes of the talk. Um, so SPS 36 is a signature that's been associated with biallelic YH mutations, again, because this is a germline community, um, and many of our germline geneticists have actually reported this. The main reason I wanted to highlight it is because it looks very similar to SBS 18, right? It's nearly identical. Th this particular signature I've shown with error bars um, because that was the only picture I had, I'm afraid. But but the tallest peaks are basically identical between these two signatures. So I am, I guess, highlighting that sometimes it can be a little bit tricky um, to distinguish signatures. The good thing is in SBS 36, you tend towards a hypermutative phenotype. Okay, so SBS 18 tends to be 10 to the power of 3, 10 to the power of 4. SBS 36 tends to be 10 to the power of 4, 10 to the power of 5, 10, you know, so higher mutation burden and associate with mode YH biallelic germline mutations. Um, this has been validated in experimental setting. It's more frequent in colorectal cancers. Um, and yeah, it's just a good one not to miss because of the germline implications. In general, people find the germline variants and then report the signature. OK, so why? The question is, why are the signatures so similar to each other? For those of you who like a bit of biochemistry, um, the signatures are so similar to each other because they are primarily due to an excess of oxidative damage to guanine. This is the easiest way to mutate guanine, basically, or you have oxygen everywhere. And 8-oxo-G is a common DNA damage outcome in your DNA. Now, 8-oxo-G um, could pair with C. That would be the ideal situation. It, you know, it pairs correctly. And what you need is OG1, which is a glycosylase. It's called 8-oxo-G glycosylase. It usually removes 8-oxo-G. This is 8-oxo-G here. So this is a correct pairing, but you've still got 8 oxo G, and so your DNA repair pathway comes along, OG1 comes along and removes 8 oxo G and puts it back into a normal G. This is the good, correct outcome that you would like. Now, MUT YH acts in this pathway to do this, because sometimes when you have 8 oxo G, instead of pairing with a C, it pairs with an A. 8 oxo G prefers to pair with an A. It looks more like a T, and that's why it pairs with an A. Now, that's not good because this is how you're going to get a mutation. So to get rid of that, MUTYH has to come along. And what MUTYH does is it removes the A. So MUTYH's job, it's a glycosylase as well, but its job is to remove A's that have mispaired with 8-oxo-G. And then it goes down the OG1 pathway. And that is why the MUTYH and the OG1 signatures are so similar in appearance to each other. OK, um, that's why you get these two different outcomes. Right, so uh, in the interest of time, um, a couple of other things here. There's a long tandem duplicators. Um, this one is a bit more um, uh, tenuous, I wouldn't say tenuous, but, but there's still a lot more clinical work to do. There's still a lot more validation work to do, but I'm highlighting them because you will hear about them in cancer research or um, uh, seminars in cancer uh, conferences. So long tandem duplicators, these are rearrangements. I mentioned um, the rearrangement signature three in the BRCA deficient tumors where the tandem duplications are short, they're 10 KB or less. But in RS1, they are 100 KB or more. And in RS14, they are one megabase or more. So there's a big duplication and it's reinserted. And RS1 is associated with cyclin E1 amplifications. RS14 is associated with CDK12 mutations. Both of these have been associated with poor prognosis in TNBC. This one in particular, CDK12, uh, with poor prognosis in ovarian cancer. So I'm only highlighting them because people have started to report on some of these. So you have to watch this space. This is going to change. And then there's a couple of others to just keep your eye on, which is the Apobec signatures down here is SPS2 and SPS13. They're very similar to each other. Um, they have this, this very particular pattern and they occur at TPCs. And SBS17, which are mainly T2G mutations at these particular sites. Um, the only reason I mention them is because they are reported to be enriched in metastatic cancer. So they may be a bit of a harbinger of poor outcomes down the line, but very early days yet, still something to just be aware of. OK, so I've sort of galloped through um, the signatures um, in more in sort of detail, <laughs> um, but I hope that the summary tables in green help you sort of to to um, look at things in a more clinical way. Uh, so in this webinar, we covered uh, what a mutational signature is, um, how to um, think about uh, what a signature extraction is, how a signature extraction is performed, what are the caveats associated with that clinically for you you're going to assume that the signatures that have been extracted are fine. You're just going to use those signatures. 
to assign them to your samples. And then I've suggested ways to think about the signature results that you get. Don't just swallow what people give you. Have a little think about whether it fits. Does it fit? If you see something that's clinically relevant, what are the additional things to look out for um, to help support your suspicion? So that's it. I'm going to stop there. I would like to just uh, say a couple of acknowledgements. I didn't get to it last time round, which is that all the work that you have heard is based on a lot of work done by other people and a lot of vision of other people, whether it's a human genome project or whether it's the International Cancer Genome Consortium or the Hartwig or CPCT or TCGA or even Genomics England. They had the vision to collect the data. People like me come along and play with the data and then get to tell the stories from the data. But why we are really standing on the shoulders of giants. I'd like to thank the patients, families and the clinicians that have contributed samples. All of these people are my various funders and of course my wonderful team without which I wouldn't be able to put all the slides together today. So I'd like to thank them all very, very much and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Serena, that was fantastic. You use the phrase mind boggling in the middle of that, and I think that, you know, is evident. Um, but, you know, you made a very complicated topic very palatable. So thanks so much. Um, there's a couple of questions. Some of them are technical and some of them are more related to, to therapy. So I'm just going to fly through. We won't get to them all, but um, I'll pick the, the most interesting, well, not interesting, but the most interesting to me personally. Um, so one person has asked, um, if you can use whole exome data to generate these signatures and if they're different to those that you generate from whole genome analysis? Okay, so um, oh, nice tough question right at the start. <laughs> so the um, order of magnitude reduction is, you know, a hundredfold between genome to an exome. Um, and so the numbers of mutations you get from a genome, let's say is about 4,000. The number that you'll get from an exome is 40. And so when you've got 40 and you're trying to do your assignment, remember your signatures have got 96 channels. And if a sample's got three signatures, trying to divide 40 mutations across three signatures means that you're deeply underpowered. So um, can it be done? Yes, it can. Is it any good? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to do it? Yes. But, you know, is it very robust? Probably not. Now, if you have a signature that's very tall and peaky, like signature 17 that had the really clear or you have Applebeck or mismatch repair deficiency, then exomes you can probably get away with. But if you have really flat signatures, then exomes are a little bit dangerous. And those are the papers that I get to review where everyone seems to have HR deficiency. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Great. And another technical question. Uh, what if I run the extraction multiple times, will I expect different outcomes? Are the raw data not the same? OK, so this comes back to the point I made right at the start where you you would run it several times anyway to try to get all the different solutions um, and then you would try to see what the best solution is. So so, you know, um, not 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 it's it's not one run you would be when you when you when you do the extraction you would be running that algorithm recurrently to try to see what the best results going to be and yeah it's not it's not precise it's a multiple solution problem and um i came i covered this point in webinar one as well actually we we this happens in copy number analysis this is not new this is not a new problem uh, but i think it's very much in people's heads like oh my god how do we how do we know what we're looking at is correct <laughs> But yeah. uh, you know, I think run it many, many times, and you'll find that after you've run it many times, actually some of the solutions tend to look rather similar to each other. So you know that you've probably settled into the right spot. Fantastic. Um, another really interesting question here. So in a research setting with NGS data, do we assign mutational signatures on the drivers alone, or the drivers and the passengers? Or and they. great. Okay. And another question aligned to that: Are there any publicly available tools to assign signatures on their data? Yes, yes, there are, um, which I didn't put down in here because I consider that like highly technical stuff, but I can provide that sort of information as well. Yes, yes, there's, there's about eight or nine tools. We've got a new one that's coming out very, very shortly, hopefully, um, which is based on Genomics England data so that people you can literally, you know, put in one line of code and it will run it for you for your tumor type um, on the latest version of the gel analysis um, and um, uh, well, yeah, and that will be freely available shortly. Fantastic. And some therapy related questions, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this actually, but when you identify a mutational signature, say for poly or for HRD, can you use the signature to, to confer eligibility for a particular targeted agent, even if a mutation hasn't been identified in the relevant gene? 
Um, so this is a regulatory question mm. and we're not there yet, but it, it, you know, I think we need to do the studies in this country to try to demonstrate that we should be able to, because, you know, like a third of the BRCA deficient cancers, we can't find a cause, but we can see the signatures and mismatch repair as well in, in, especially in the non-colorectal and non-uterine, you can see the signature, it's there, but we just can't find the cause. And it feels slightly crazy that we need to have a driver mutation, but right now, Today, I think you you would need the driver mutation, so we're not there yet, but we'd like to be able to push it to that point. That whole mismatch repair deficiency question is uh, Pandora's box because we already struggle with the Lynch like just on the IHC. So um, hold fire for a while if you're choosing that problem. Um, another question, sorry, I know I'm conscious we're, we're running out of time. We could keep you here all day. Um, someone has commented on the fact that TP3, a TP53 mutated tumours tend to be genomically quite quiet. And what's what's the reason for that? TP, TP53, like in terms of the, the TMB, so they tend not to be hypermutated. If they're P53 mutated? Really? <laughs> this person apparently in endometrial cancers, so this oh. person has said in their endometrial cancers, they've noticed that TP53 mutant tumours tend to have a low TMB. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, um, I yeah, so I, 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 I don't know what the causes there might be. Um, I think and hopefully in the next webinar, I'm going to we're going to walk through some samples where I, it's every patient so individual sometimes, you know, so where the one of the examples actually that I had was a uterine cancer, but it had a P53 mutation, but it definitely had BRCA mutagenesis. So it had a low TMB in the sense that it didn't hit the mm. threshold that mismatch repair and polymerase epsilon mutants usually are high TMB. It's got a low TMB, but it is was still genomically unstable and it was a BRCA deficient cancer and it was P53 mutated. So, uh, you know, I think, yeah, I think what we need to do is start looking at the whole genome and interpreting all of it together. Uh, so not just mutational signatures, although I've given that whole lecture on signatures, I don't think it's the be all and end all at all. I actually think you need to take everything together, including the drivers, including the germline and interpret all of it together. And that's what I'm hoping to cover in the next um, webinar. Um, but, you know, the, we are in early stages where, you know, and I'm just trying to get more people to sort of think the way we think um, and, uh, and and hopefully we'll all learn together because there's so much to do. Um, but, I, you know, although I've sort of am a proponent of mutational signatures, by no means do I think it's a be all and end all. I think we need to bring all of the information together, potentially including transcriptomics in due course. It's like everything, isn't it? It's context yeah. specific, I guess, you know. Right. Brilliant. So I think we, we're probably at time now. As I said, I could talk to you all day. Selfishly, I'd love to, but um, I am conscious that we're at the end of our time. I can only thank you once again um, and to remind everybody that this is only the second of three webinars and, and Serena's already given you little hints as to what's coming up in the next talk. So I'm certainly really looking forward to it. I enjoyed this immensely as, as with last week's as well. So thanks so much for your time again. It's been wonderful. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. See you soon. Bye.